All right, we're recording. Um, good afternoon, everybody. My name is not Amber Schiltz. Um, I am actually Grace Gard, if you don't know me. And I'm just filling in for Amber today with this awesome Lunch and Learn series. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's Conservation Education Lunch and Learn series is um, a series facilitated by uh, Nebraska Game and Parks Fish and Wildlife Education Division and explores the science behind educational efforts and practices by learning from experts on a variety of science and educational topics. So um, I'm not going to talk at you for too long because Hannah's here to talk to you all, but just some quick housekeeping things. If you have questions throughout, please feel free to put those in the chat. And um, as Hannah has pause points or you know, if there's a, a major one, I can have her stop and we'll, we'll answer them, but also we'll definitely get to them all at the end. So please feel free to put questions in there um, and we'll make sure we, we address those. And then I'm going to let Hannah, she's our Planning and Trails Assistant Division Administrator with Game and Parks, go ahead and introduce herself and get us started. All right. Thank you, Grace. Um, and thank you for the invitation to do this uh, lunch and learn topic. Um, it's something that's near and dear to my heart and um, I'm excited to chat with you all today. So my name is Hannah Jones. I'm an assistant division administrator in planning and programming. Um, one of the things I have the privilege of working on is this uh, comprehensive statewide plan um, that covers outdoor recreation in Nebraska. Nebraska. And this plan is really important um, because it covers a lot of different avenues of why people recreate, how do they recreate, demographics. I'll get into some of that today, but kind of like Grace said, if you do have questions as we move through, put them in the chat. I'm happy to stop at any point. This is pretty informal, so happy to just kind of have a dialogue. Um, if there's if there's some good discussion happening, I want to I want to keep that going. But absolutely, we can. Uh, cover things at the end as well. The first thing I want to ask you to do today is think about how important outdoor recreation is to you. Um, and so if you just like kind of pause and eat your lunch <laughs> and think about how important is your outdoor recreation to you? And, you know, odds are a lot of the folks on this call are, you know, conservationists, biologists, um, park staff, um, folks that already work in outdoor recreation. And so it's a part of your life um, as a professional, but personally, you know, how does it impact your life? Um, and as you start to think about that, you know, um, think about the ways that it can affect your quality of life, your mental health, your physical um, abilities, um, I mean, just all facets of how it actually affects your life. Um, you know, and every five years, we also do a general Nebraska survey and general Nebraskans say that it's very important to um, them. Outdoor recreation has a huge impact. Um, this number, this 57.2%, uh, it does not fluctuate significantly every time we do this survey. Um, it stays around that 60% or more. Um, of folks that believe outdoor recreation is very important to, you know, their livelihood and their quality of life. And so it's just a testament to um, the impact that it has and, um, and how, it, how it affects us. The next thing I'd like you to do is just think about your outdoor recreation story. So you just saw the number of almost 60%, you know, of Nebraskans think that outdoor recreation is really important. Um, now I want you to think about like, how do you actually interact with your recreational spaces when you're outdoors? Um, and, and how, and what does that mean to you? Do you go kayaking on the river and enjoy the scenic beauty and wildlife viewing opportunities? Maybe dip your toes in. Do you go out to a beautiful cabin and just be away from it all with no service? <laughs> Do you think about how it impacts your kids or your nieces and nephews and cousins? Do you think about the exploration piece, even the small pieces like the life cycle of a leaf? 
I mean, it's it, it runs the gamut. Outdoor recreation can affect us in so many different ways. And so what I want to talk to you about today is this this plan, this comprehensive plan and the impact that it has and that it can have in the work that you do across the state. And so, and if you're not with the Game and Parks Commission and you're within another profession, let's say you're in healthcare or you're with the universities or another profession, think about how this could be used in what you do. So this is a plan that has to be updated every five years um, in order to maintain our eligibility for something called the Land and Water Conservation Fund. This fund is through the National Park Service. It's a federal grant program. And what SCORP does, and SCORP stands for the Statewide Comprehensive Outdoor Recreation Plan, what SCORP does is it compiles a lot of different information within it um, and helps us maintain our eligibility for this program. So this program has been around, this land and water conservation program has been around for a really long time, since about 1965. And what it does is it funds outdoor recreation projects across Nebraska. Um, approximately 52 million has been in federal dollars um, has been spent on outdoor recreation projects since 1965. So that puts us at about 104 million in total because it's a 50-50 match grant program. And so what this SCORP does is it helps maintain our eligibility for this program. Without us having a comprehensive outdoor rec plan, we would not be eligible for this funding. And so um, back in 2020, it became permanently authorized, which is fantastic. That means that we can continue to fund these beautiful projects across the state um, forever. So, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so that's a really important piece. Um, who's eligible for this program? Um, it's political subdivisions, it's cities and counties, villages. Um, but the caveat here is that um, oftentimes these projects that are applying for these grants, um, they, they are oftentimes started by friends groups or um, nonprofits folks that are at the coffee shop having a conversation about what they need that they don't have when it comes to outdoor recreation. And then they take it to their, their city council or their board and have a discussion about it and start to talk about, you know, the discussion of funding and finding the match. So um, I just wanted to kind of highlight this a little bit here is that, you know, we are accepting grant applications for this program until September 4th. So for those of you that work for Game and Parks, if you have an eligible project that you're thinking about, um, or you know folks in your community, in your personal life, in your philanthropic efforts, um, and, and you have a good project, please consult with me about that because I'd be happy to help you through the application and talk about what that looks like. So let's talk a little bit more about what's actually in that SCORP and how it might be helpful for the things that you do and how it's impacted um, uh, folks within our agency, and then other grant opportunities as well across the state. So the first thing I want to show you is um, our seven different SCORP regions. We look at uh, all the data within this document is broken out by these regions um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, one is that demographics change significantly across the state as far as the demographic makeup um, within these different regions, but also because the outdoor recreation amenities and opportunities in these different areas vary considerably as well. And so it's really important to be able to look at information from a regional perspective. And SCORP basically gives you kind of that foundational component to look at this information um, in the way of demographics um, and outdoor recreation from this regional perspective. But we also look at it as a statewide basis as well. So like I said, one of the first things we talk about in SCORP um, are demographics. And so a couple of reasons this is really important. One is because it can help you get a baseline understanding of the types of um, demographics that are within your community, or sorry, that are within your area of the state. Um, but the other reason is that there may be some changes in um, household income, for example, and if you're trying to offer programs or membership-based outdoor recreation, let's say like pools and zoos or golf course amenities and things like that, and people can't afford it, and you're not sure why people aren't actually using those amenities, 
well, that may be why they can't afford to do so. And so there's just, there's a lot of ways to cut this. Um, that's just one example, but age is a big one, of course, um, looking at outdoor recreation and trying to find the right mix um, for an area. That's a huge piece of it as well. Um, oftentimes this, so this information is, is used from the census. That's uh, the source of this information. And so it's updated every five years either using the most up-to-date um, census records from the American Community Survey or the most up-to-date census um, that was just done. And so it's a very important element in the plan. Another piece that we show and highlight is we do um, an inventory of all the different public types of public lands across the state. And as most of you know, this, there's only about 2% in Nebraska that's public land. So it's really important that we offer the right type of outdoor recreation in different regions across the state when it comes to our federal lands, our open fields and waters, the, the land that we own and maintain, et cetera. So this is another place, again, it's kind of like a clearinghouse of information just to get you started. Another thing that's in there is um, in, an inventory of all the local amenities in each community. This is really important because um, amenities change throughout different communities or they become inactive. And so every five years we update that information as well. So we have the most accurate information from the 365 plus you know, communities across the state. Um, and what they're offering in the way of all their facilities and amenities and then also their trails and what type of trails they're offering and how many miles of trails they have, if they have wildlife viewing opportunities they've added um, and that sort of thing. And so this is another important piece um, kind of of the puzzle to, to be looking at. And, you know, oftentimes communities will look at this from <clears throat> kind of the regional perspective to see, okay, does, for example, uh, does my community next door that's five miles away already have a pool and a softball or a baseball um, complex? Do we need that here? Should we have discussion about um, some other opportunities that we could be offering, maybe a trail loop and a pond or fishing access opportunities, things like that. So this can come in handy in the way of that as well. Another component um, that we talk about are wetlands. Um, wetlands are incredibly important in the state of Nebraska and they're incredibly important in this plan. Um, not only are they of re required, it's a requirement of National Park Service for us to talk about wetlands and what are offered in Nebraska, but we took it a step further to really make the connection between outdoor recreation. What types of things can you offer in wetlands and in wetland areas to help educate people about what they have to offer, how they impact our life, and why we need to safeguard them? And so um, I'm, I'm sure pretty much everybody on this call knows Ted LaGrange um, and, you know, he's the author, he's one of the authors of this guide to the Nebraska's wetlands. And this is something that we refer to in our score because we want to make sure people are educated and understand the importance and appreciation for wetlands and how they can be part of their recreation efforts across the state. So another piece that we cover is demand is really what this is getting at. And so we look at, you know, what do people actually, what are they actually doing um, when it comes to outdoor recreation and what do they wanna see that they aren't seeing um, or that they would like to see more of? And you won't be surprised that, um, so one of the things we do is we separate this information from local parks and state parks because what people do in, local parks may differ a little bit from what they do in a state park and how they interact with the space. And so, um, and there's about, I think in our survey, we do about 28 um, different options. And so these are just the top five. Um, this is as a statewide um, basis. This is not looking at any particular region, but you'll notice that hiking and biking trails and um, you can read them on the screen, but hiking and biking trails in particular has been a in the top five for the last two decades or more, actually, probably close to three decades now. And so it just shows the importance of and have and the importance of this particular amenity and that they're inc they're incredibly important in the toolbox and in the toolkit of outdoor recreation. 
And then in state parks, the only difference you're really going to see here is our, um, our visitor centers and our campsites um, from the way of local parks. But if you start to really funnel it down into kind of the top 10, you'll start to see fishing access and hunting areas and wildlife viewing areas and things like that. And so again, this try, this try what this tries to do is just give us a glimpse and an understanding of what is the general public saying, not what are our current users saying, what's the general public saying when we ask them, how are you using our parks? How are you interacting with the space? And then finally, we always ask, what would you like to see more of and what would you like to add to the landscape? And so you'll notice even here, even though folks, I mean, folks use these hiking and biking trails um, and they're heavily used across our state and in communities, 76.3% um, wanted to see more. And do note that you can pick more than one of these, which is why the percentages are higher. Um, infrastructure, when you actually break that down, it's mainly just like additional roadways or improved roadways um, in parks and uh, bathrooms and shower houses and electrical upgrades. Um, in our next survey effort, we do plan to break that out more so we can really understand what are people looking for when it comes to infrastructure, but that's just kind of a conglomerate and why it's so high. In the way of adventure activities, this is something that was not in previous, um, not in the top five um, in our previous surveys. And so it's quite interesting that a lot more folks are wanting to see um, things like rock climbing walls and go apes courses, ropes courses, um, adventure activities, those thrill seekers. We're seeing a lot more of that, um, especially in this next wave of, uh, well, millennials and Gen Xers or Gen Z. <laughs> and um, so that's an important component because although sometimes we think we know what people are asking for and what they want to see, sometimes we don't. And so it's really important to um, use some of this data as kind of a launching point to have the discussion. And I'll talk a little bit more about that as we maneuver through. So something else that's in SCORP is our goals. Um, these goals are formulated um, in a couple of different ways. And so as a part of every um, time that we update this document, we create a technical advisory committee. And that is usually um, a conglomerate of educators, biologists, recreation professionals, and providers across the state. And um, if there are some community champions that want to be involved, we usually try to involve them as well. And so we they help us kind of try to identify what changes we're seeing in in Nebraska, but really a lot of these are created based on that general survey and what are people actually wanting to see more of and what do they need help with, um, and what are we seeing as far as trends with national survey efforts, and what does what do we may what what are we where we may not where we may not be hitting some of the marks and so. That's why you're going to see some of the things on here. And the biggest thing to point out to you is that this is critically important, um, is that it takes all of us to create great outdoor recreational spaces. Um, and, and when I say all of us, I mean, not just us that are in the profession, but those that aren't in the profession. We need to start finding the links between healthcare and some of these other um, facets of um of health really that that connect with outdoor recreation and can help promote outdoor recreation in this positive lens. We saw that during COVID, um, that it was the escape place. It helped with mental health crisis. It helped with solitude and finding those areas um, that were more secluded and away from people. Um, and so these are, these are really important. Um, the other reason they're really important is because through the Land and Water Conservation Fund application process, uh, we highly rank, um, so if there is a project that comes to us and they can identify how that project correlates with one or more of these goals and how it's going to help implement one or more of these goals, they get ranked, they're, they're competitive, their application is more competitive. And so they get more points for that. And so it's, so we're trying really hard to make sure that the implementation of these goals is happening in multiple facets. And so um, one of the things that's part of each of these goals is we have taken it even a step further and broken out kind of the step-by-step -step approach 
Um, and so within each of the goals, we say, how could you actually implement these things? And, and what could you do um, to start that process? Um, if you, and it didn't, and it doesn't matter if you are um, a small village with 200 people or you're Lincoln in a metro area. Um, we tried to appease anybody that's on um, either spectrum of their recreational journey. And no matter how much funding you have, you can still have conversations with your constituents. You can still go and talk to them and try to really suss out what they want. And so um, that's kind of the design and intent of of our goals chapter and trying to guide recreation in the way that, um, that those goals were designed, basically those ideologies. So then we have our priority projects for that land and water funding. And so what you'll see on the screen is this list of projects that is basically comes from that general survey. Again, I can't stress how important that survey is. Um, Basically, we can create, we create this list based on what people are wanting to see more of and what they're using. And we fact check that by talking to communities and talking to our technical advisory committee to make sure that these are um, also things that they're looking for. Because of course, a survey can only touch so only touches so many folks, even if it's, if it's statistically valid. And so we want to make sure we're checking all those boxes. Um, but Another piece of our land and water application is trying to understand, like, is the project falling into one of these priority project areas? If it is, it is highly likely it's going to be more competitive. So let's talk about some examples of projects. Uh, this one is pretty cool. Um, this is a project that was just completed, oh gosh, I think it was last year out in Central City, which is just north of Grand Island. And they put in their first inclusive playground. This is, I want to note, in a low-income area. Um, it all and this particular design of this project was intended for multiple age groups and abilities, um, folks with different sensory needs, and um, they tried to offer varying levels of accessibility with this design. They even went as far as um, offering rental equipment, like sports balls and equipment to remove the barrier for families um, who may not be able to afford to buy their own basketball or volleyball or whatever. And so they did, they wanted to remove as many barriers as they possibly could for folks to um, have a safe place to play. And a, another project I want to note here too, and um, that we, that we just uh, awarded this past January. And so it's not built yet, but I just wanted to give you guys a heads up that the there's going to be another inclusive there's going to be an inclusive playground at Mahoney Park not the state park but Lincoln Mahoney Park over on 70th and Fremont it's going to be fabulous um the design of that uh, the the important piece and why I'm bringing it up is that that whole entire thing started because of one mom with a 25 year old son who has autism and um you know is mute came to the city of Lincoln and said, I need your help. Um, my son doesn't have a safe place to play, you know, and that started the ball rolling for them to create a committee to start this project and this beautiful initiative to get things done. And it is designed with the, with the instruction and um, input of that committee. And so again, you know, it just goes to show that a lot of these things happen because of one or two people or a community champion, for example. And that's really how this one occurred. So this Lynch splash pad project uh, was just completed. Um, we went up there a couple weeks ago and, and, and met with um, who I'm going to deem as a community champion because she absolutely is. Uh, but this is a repurposed uh, softball complex and or little baseball diamond area and you'll see that on the left there they left the little dugout area so that they have shade um, while the trees start to grow and mature but they planted trees they repurposed this area with an ada walking path and a splash pad why did they do that because the community wasn't really using the space 
for the intention and purpose that it was created for um, baseball and softball games anymore. And so they wanted to offer their community something that they would use. And they have an aging community, but they also have a lot of children. And so this is really a win-win for both because it offers zero entry access. It's ADA compliant. And it's going to offer um, children a nice place to play. There's still a fence boundary around it so the kids can still go out into the ball field and play. Um, they put beautiful benches in here. Um, and we had a really great discussion of how, you know, you know, they want to expand it into having like a natural playscape area next to this. And so this is just one of those examples of how, you know, looking at what a community has and talking to them face to face about, you know, what could this be is huge. Um, and I will know a lot of these communities don't have a huge staff. And so we're working and talking with folks that run three jobs. I mean, the gal that uh, was spearheading this project and initiative also worked at the hospital and was also on a foundation board. And so it's just, you know, they're wearing five hats. And so the more help they can get by using information and data from SCORP and also getting assistance from us, you know, the better. Another example is the Platte River State Park National Playground. I hope that everyone on this call has been there. If you haven't, you should go check it out. It's pretty cool. Um, but this was another land and water project that was recently completed. And what it does is it offers varying levels of play, um, of play. And so you start out with kind of this introductory um, natural playscape experience for kind of the younger kiddos. And then you go to more complex natural playground experience on the other side where you've got kind of that adventure seeking um, opportunity um, on the other side. And so this is a phenomenal project that used land and water to complete it. Um, they've even installed at Platte River State Park in the new RV campground. They've put in um, another, like just a little dirt mound with a slide and it's perfect. It's being heavily utilized. Um, and so it just goes to show that there are varying levels of ways to do this. Um, and it doesn't all have to be um, big and grandiose. It can be small. Another thing I wanted to point out is that the data in SCORP is often used for other grant applications. And so this is an example of a recreational trails project in Wisner River and Central Park. Um, it was basically a concrete trail that connects two parks. But the thing to note here is that SCORP data can be used for these other applications to support other grant applications. And so, um, so again, like I said, trails are, have been a top amenity for years, for decades, and it's a really great way to show support for other federal funding sources, not just land and water. And so <clears throat> this is just one of those examples. SCORP data is also used in the legislature. Um, you know, Tim McCoy, our director, um, he, he often uses information from SCORP about our top amenities and or what people want to see more of um, when it's applicable or when it's applicable in front of our board of commissioners as well. Um, another way this has been used is for uh, Cowboy Trail. So uh, this is another piece of my position that I have the pleasure of working with Alex Durie on um, is our Cowboy Recreation and Nature Trail. And about a year ago, we had some advocates and some great groups go to the legislature and try to get us additional funding. Although they were unsuccessful, they used um, information from SCORP. And that's kind of what, um, that's the point behind sharing this with you is that that information can be utilized in a lot of different ways. And, you know, when it comes to Cowboy Trail, um, going through, you know, almost 30 small communities between Norfolk and Valentine, there's a lot of varying levels of outdoor recreation um, and so, and economic vitality and things like that. And so it's really important to be able to at least use SCORP as a baseline of information when it comes to things like this. Hot River State Park mountain bike trail. I don't know if um, any of you have been here, but it's a great trail as well. Um, again, you know, this was, the impetus of this project um, really came about because a, a small nonprofit group came to Game and Parks and wanted to pursue this amazing um, project. There was a void in this particular area when it came to um, mountain biking. 
And so they helped fill that void and they helped find the additional funding um, to help to help build this trail. And so the other thing I want to note about this particular project is this monumental entry and how important this can be when it comes to projects. Um, it's really important to be able to help folks know that they've arrived at a, st at, at a particular um, juncture. And so for, for the case of the mountain bike trails, what this does is it helps people know that they've arrived. There's even a um, like a bike repair little station right behind here. Um, and then the map here shows varying levels of difficulty of the four miles, four plus miles of trails that are in this area. Um, so again, this is just another example of, of, um, of outdoor recreation and filling a void in an area that didn't have this type of outdoor recreation before. So the last thing I want to mention is that, uh, so SCORP is going to be undergoing an update very soon. Uh, the one that we're currently in is going to expire at the end of 2025. And so really our key driver is we want to make it as user-friendly as possible. Um, this last round we've done, we did quite a bit of that. Uh, we tried really hard to condense um, uh information and try to make infographics that are user-friendly, what we've seen is that folks basically print that off and take it to their board meetings um, because it's enough information for them to make support for their project. Um, but the thing I really want to note here is, you know, we're open to ideas. Um, and so Aaron Johnson is actually going to be um, kind of the lead project manager for this next SCORP. And so over the next couple of years, she's going to be working really hard on 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 that on this project. And so, if you want to be part of the technical advisory committee, um, we absolutely welcome you to reach out to us, um, and we'd be happy to to discuss that opportunity with you. Um, also, if you have general surveys that you're conducting in your different divisions or in your professions and it pertains to um, something that could boost and help the data that's within SCORP, please share your information with us because we would be happy to highlight that information and use it. Um, but the last thing is, you know, when in the way of making it user-friendly, we'd really like to try to digitize some of this stuff. And so, you know, there's ideas floating around about trying to create story maps, um, within Esri or other options that help us basically update information like the inventory of, of amenities across the state in different communities and things like that very easily um, and be able to have it readily available as like a clearinghouse for folks to just go jump on and find information. And so um, if you're interested at all, please reach out to us. And with that, I will actually take any questions that you guys have. Um, I do wanna also mention that there is an electronic version. It's at that web address there. And then if you do want a hard copy, um, please, please reach out and I'm happy to mail that to you. Um, but yeah, I'll go ahead and stop there and see if there's any questions. going to say, I think people should be able to unmute themselves. If you're not, you can request that or put it in the chat. So oh, we got a big one. Um, Olivia says, I'm curious, does the SCORP survey ask about what activities people are doing instead of amenities or facilities used? So I'll just stop at that. There's more, but I'll stop with that. Yeah, so we do ask that question, but I think in this next iteration, what I'd like to do is is uh, dive into that even more and expand um, because it was kind of a conglomerate. Um, it was kind of both facilities and um, kind of activities based question. And so I think that we could definitely improve upon that. Okay. I'm just, I'm the watchable wildlife biologist. So I focus on wildlife viewing and um 
So that's where I'm kind of biased when it comes to this stuff. And I'm just curious how wildlife viewing is like captured in the SCORP um, uh, plan since they don't always use facilities or amenities, but good to know. Sure. And I think one of the, so one of the ways that we highlight it now is wildlife. So we highlight it when we talk about the wetlands chapter, but we also talk about it in demand um, because there was a couple of regions where it was actually in the top five of things they want to see more of. And it really was um, geared toward like accessibility for wildlife viewing. And so get it, make sure, making sure you can actually get to the site um, to be able to do wildlife viewing. And I think that part of that, we could probably do a better job of explaining, you know, how did how we can how you can do that in an urban setting or a rural setting and how wildlife viewing can, can be captured in so many different ways so honestly olivia i would love to collaborate with you on that um possibly and and talk about ways that we could improve that i would love that yeah i'll reach out to you in an email thank you And then Hannah, I don't know if you see, but Megan asked, does the SCORP survey ask if recreation activities differ across areas of the state? So what we do, Megan, is we uh, separate it by region. And so we look at a statewide perspective when it comes to those activities, but we also look at it by region. Um, I, and so we look at um, water-based activities, we look at land-based activities and um, I believe we also did snow-based activities this last time. And so um, we do look at that and the frequency in which people used it. And that's all like those details are in that print print version? Yeah, they are. Yep. Okay. In the in uh chapter four. We tried to make as many infographics as possible. I tried to keep those out today because they're, it's a lot to digest. <laughs> mm -hmm. Maybe one other minute in case anyone else has a question. In case someone is furiously typing in the chat, give it a minute. <laughs> Yeah, and I feel like these summer ones too, because it's what it's June. I just feel like so many people are um, yeah. field work and and yeah, mm -hmm. it's a busy time. Yeah, well, if no one has any other questions, um, we'll we'll probably um, wrap it up here. But thank you everyone for joining, and thanks, Hannah. That was. Uh, a lot of stuff I didn't know. So it's great, great to hear about some of those projects we're doing. And I've been to the mountain bike trails at Platte River. They're super fun, kind of scary, but super fun. <laughs> so yeah, thank you so much for, for being here on the Lunch and Learn. And yeah, I think all of you have Hannah's email. So if you have questions after this, please do reach out to her. And yeah, I think we'll go ahead and end it there. Awesome. Thank you all for the time today. And thank you for attending. I appreciate it. Thank you, Grace. Yep. Thanks so much, everybody. All right.